Por la voz, el micrófono. Okay. ¿Puedo andar? ¿Puedo andar? Ok. So, we, welcome for this evening. We are going to add some more details about uh, the web application so that uh, we will be able to do something a bit more complicated and also a bit more nice to see than what you have been uh, uh, developing in the lab uh, in the previous hour. Uh, you remember that uh, last uh, class uh, we finished uh, this exercise uh, quite in a rush. And uh, one topic uh, that was at the end uh, about the sessions uh, was just uh, described very quickly. And uh, I left you, with, with many of you, with the open eyes uh, and uh, staring at the, at the concept. So I, I will spend some time uh, reviewing that topic. So what were we trying to do here? We are trying to capture some information from the user through a form. Okay? And this form could be processed by another page. Nothing strange here. What we learned is that uh, we may have, uh, let me open, we may have uh, one template. This is this one that contains a form. Let's don't, don't look at everything because here you, have, you already have the full solution, but. Uh, you may have a form element that is used for giving the user the opportunity to enter information. A form is a container of uh, input elements. There are many types of input elements, from checkboxes to text areas and so on, all in the form. One of the input elements is always, or very often, a button for submitting the uh, data information to the server. So all the form processing is done inside the client browser. When I click on submit, the data from the different fields is collected, is packed up, is inserted into the HTTP request, and is sent to the server. At that point, the server receives the data. The server, uh, well, the, the form is sent to the server to a specific address, okay? to a specific URL, which is the URL that they are sending the data here. I specify it in the action attribute of the form element. So form is just a container. The action is the web page, the logic of the web page that we will process the data that the user is sending. And usually, a form may be uh, submitted with two different uh, HTTP methods. One is the method get, the classical one, and the other is method post. Uh, we will see next time when we talk about more about HTTP and the rest uh, um, uh, architecture, the difference between the two. But uh, for now, the main difference is that get, uh, the method get, encodes all the parameters on the URL. So if I'm using method get, in this case, I would have a, a URL, la, URL la, like a slash login, question mark, user, which is the name of the uh, input data, equal, and my name. All visible on the address bar of the browser. If I don't want this to be visible, and visible also means easy to modify by the user, which I don't like, we can use method post that encodes the data in the same way, but uh, the data is not part of the URL. Instead, instead, the data is encoded in the body of the HTTP request. We saw last time that the uh, HTTP request had a set of headers, and the response had headers and a body, which was the HTML page. Actually, I lied, because uh, also HTTP requests may have a body. In the case of post requests, uh, the body of the request is the, contains the data associated with that request. Okay, but practically, <coughs> uh, 
we define a page login that needs to handle this data. And this login page has access to all the information that were in the previous page through the attribute form of the object request. So request is an implicit object in Flask that always contains information about the currently executed request, request at the HTTP level. One of the attributes of request is form. Form is a dictionary, a Python dictionary. Okay, So you can index this dictionary for getting all the uh, input values that the user has typed into. The key of the dictionary is, of course, the name of the input elements. So I call this input element user, and I retrieve it by querying the form dictionary with key user. And so it gets the information that the user typed in. We need to be sure that the names match, and it's the responsibility of the programmer to do that. There's no automatic control. There cannot be any automatic control over that. OK, well, what can we do with this? Well, this name is then can then be printed, for example, on the HTML response. How do we do that? How can we include a variable element into the into the, uh, template? Well, we need to pass a parameter to the template itself. So you see that a render template, the welcome template, by passing one parameter, user equal to user, this right end user is the value that I'm passing. The value is taken from this local variable that I just created. And I'm giving to this value a name, user. This name can be used by the template to extract the value. OK? So I expect the template welcome to use at a, certain, at a certain point to make use of the user parameter. Just to be sure about the matching, I can say maybe if I change the name of this parameter, user underscore name, well, this will be the, I need to change it because it will be the name of the parameter on the other side. Okay, never confuse the key with the value. And here we are doing a double jump. That's the first jump from the name of the input element that, that came from the HTML of the previous page to the name of a local variable. User is a name of a variable that will include the value coming from the user. And this name, variable name is used to get the value to associate to a different key. And this key is the parameter name that can be used by the template. So just uh, we are taking a, a name from the user. The user types it in through HTTP POST request, goes to the server. The server, the Flask application, puts it into the form dictionary. We take it out from the dictionary. We put it into a variable. We take this variable. We pass as a parameter into the template. The template gets the value of this parameter and includes it into the HTML and sends the HTML back to the client. OK, so we are. Yep. Uh, I, I didn't talk about section right now. So I, if I wait, if you wait one minute, I will reply. So right now, what we've done, we have the, what we've done up to this point is to get to this page. The, the issue that uh, about sessions, about what we left uh, last, last time is, how can we go back to the home page and see the home page with small differences? Because now the user is registered, is logged in, or is whatever. 
what we can do, what, what can we do in the, at the login page? Well, login uh, only contains a link. Continue, go back to the home page. And so it will link, it will uh, correspond if I, is it running? No. Uh, let, let me run it. Um, you see, we are visiting the home page, the root node of the, the root page of the website. I put something inside, and the, the login will link. You see, in the, at the bottom of the page, the link is always localhost 500 and nothing more. So the server has no way, according to the HTTP protocol, to distinguish this request, the initial one, from that request, the one after the login. OK? Because there are two separate, identical HTTP requests at the moment. So we should make something. Okay, so that uh, in some way, let's put it like this, uh, we are saving this name somewhere so that uh, in processing this request, uh, the name can be remembered. This is not something that HTTP can do. It's the application server, server in this case Flask, is, must do it. How, how do we do it? Practically, and then we see how it works uh, at the protocol level. From a practical point of view, we use uh, one uh, variable which is called session inside Flask. It's a variable defined by Flask. And uh, what is a session? It's a dictionary, initially empty, or with no meaningful information, where the user can store information or the programmer that can store information. This information is persistent across future calls by the same user. How does it work? Well, it works that up to this point, uh, everything is inside the Python code. Then we have the HTML, and we return the HTML to the browser. If the programmer has set something inside the session variable, so I set some value to a key, then inside this HTML, we hide, or the Flask application will hide some information. Actually, this information will be hidden in the HTTP response headers. In particular, one header called cookie. Huh? So there's a, a small bit of information that will be inserted into this uh, response. What does the uh, browser gets this information? Gets the information with the headers and uh, the HTML page. As usual, it will display the HTML page, and also it will process the headers. When the browser receives a cookie, which is just a, a, a string of text, it does a favor to the server. It's, it remembers it. So cookies are just something that the server gives to the browser and saying, please remember this. OK? I always imagine being a person with a very short memory. And so while you're talking to me, if you tell me something, I reply. But right after replying to you, I forget. And so if you come to me again one second after, I say, what are you? I don't remember. And so, because I know my problem, when I reply to you, I also give you a small you know, uh, note saying, please, when you talk to me again, 
first hand me that note. So I will reply to you, giving you the note, the cookie, and then I forget about you. The next time you request something, you give me the note that I wrote for myself. I read, OK, this person just asked this. OK, tell me. And I, I'm ready to listen to the rest of the conversation. Because I noted and saved uh, the important points of the conversation, the state of the application, the state of the session of our conversation. Right? The only problem is that I cannot remember it, and so you should do it. So many users can talk to me at the same time, and I won't get confused, because every user will have his own copy of the note with the state of the conversation that I had with that user, because there are different notes, different session variables values for the same variables, right? So uh, this is the mechanism. At the next uh, iteration, uh, on say, and every next request from the same browser to the same server, the browser will send up again a copy of the cookie to the server, OK? And so the server will recover all the information that had just uh, forgotten, but it was saved into this cookie. So the next time we render the, the index template, we can query this uh, session object. The session object is accessible from the, the Python code. It's a dictionary, normal, and also from the template code. So I can write, uh, it's a dictionary, so I should write like this, OK, with a proper Python syntax. And it's a if uh, session user is not empty. OK, so you know, in Python, every object is true. The absence of an object, the none object, so no object means false. So this query actually, the instruction here actually means if there is one uh, value with key user in the dictionary. So if the user was ever stored in this dictionary, did the user ever, ever log in? And inside templates, uh, there is a simplified syntax, so we can use uh, more easily dictionaries like there were properties. So it's just a syntax simplification that we can use in templates, right? So this means if the user had entered his name, the only way the session object may have a user value, a value corresponding to the user key, the only way is whether the, the Python code ever executed this instruction there. Right? So I'm trusting this information, and if the user is already logged in, I can write some information in the page. Otherwise, I will create the form that we just saw. The form is being created if no user has been registered yet. OK, so in the session, we store the essential information about the state of the conversation, whether it's logged in or not, the name, the language, maybe, something that we need to reply to, to the user. Um, there is something that makes me a bit uh, anxious or worrying is that uh, I am to decide whether to unlock to the user the advanced functionality of the website, so accessible on, only to registered users. I am trusting the browser to provide some data. So imagine you are not a logged user in the website. You don't have the login, the password, you're not registered. 
but you could always fake a cookie. You know, a cookie is stored in the browser, and the browser sends the cookie back to the server. So what prevents a browser to send to a server a cookie on its own? It's a fake one. No? It's a false one. It's a... But yeah, I, can, <laughs> I have control of the browser. The browser can do whatever he wants. And the server has no, has no memory. So he has no way of checking the validity of the cookie it receives. And so he trusts it. So information that comes from the browser is blindly trusted to give access to the website. So if this website has uh, the, last, the, the email messages, your email messages, I can just modify my cookie and read your image because the cookie will contain the username. So this, of course, would be a very dangerous situation. Because I'm storing something in your pockets. Huh? You know the story of the person that was always afraid of getting his wallet lost or stolen, and so he saved it in someone else's pockets so that it wouldn't be stolen from him. Hmm? Um, and it's the same. I'm saving something important for me in your pockets. And then I'm trusting that you will return it to me in good shape, without modifying it, without tampering with it. How can this be possible? Encryption. I'm not uh, sending you a note written in plain text that you can read so you, that you can learn what information I, I store or that you can modify. Before sending the note to you, before sending the cookie back, the cookie is encrypted with a, with, a cre with a secret key that is known only to the server. So you will save this cookie. You, can, you cannot understand it, even if you read it. You can read it, but you will never understand it because you don't have the decryption key for this cookie, the secret key. And if you try to modify it in some way, it will become invalid because it won't match the, the key. So you have some piece of information that you cannot understand, you can read, you can modify, you cannot modify, otherwise it will get invalid. And so you can only send it to me back, to the server back in the original format, or maybe if you are angry with me, you will not send me back, but at that point I will, you will not be able to navigate the website. But the information is as secure as it is uh, depending on the encryption key. So for enabling uh, this session mechanism, the server needs uh, one secret key that the, it will be used for encrypting, encrypting all the communication with the browser. All the cookies will be encrypted with this key. If anybody knows this key, it will be able to intercept and modify every information sent and received by this website. It will be able to impersonate every user, to send fake data, and so on. So this should be actually one key different for each different web application and keep it secret in some way. Uh, Flask is very simple-minded in, uh, in this case, so it, would need, it requires you to write, to choose one secret key for yourself. Uh, it would be better to generate a random string that we can, we can do also. Uh, and uh, so every, every time we run the server, it will generate a new random one, so it will be more difficult to, to intercept, so to understand. Yes? No, it's just the, the encryption key for encrypting the cookie. So you have a plain text cookie. I encrypt it with this key, and I will send it to the browser. For, for the cookie encryption algorithm. OK, just for the cookies. All the other data is in plain text. And that has nothing to do with login password or anything else. It's just uh, 
Uh, but if you don't have this secret, you will have the encryption of, in, in the encrypted text of the, pass, uh, the cookies, and you won't be able to read it or to decode it or to recreate another one that can be decrypted correctly. Hmm? Uh, by the way, Flask does two things before sending you the cookie. It compressed it with gzip and then encrypts it. So for using the sessions, you, you need to set the secret key for the application. This mechanism is the basic one in Flask. Uh, has one problem, the size of these cookies being exchanged. Because all the, all the dictionary, all the section dictionary, is being sent back and forth twice a request, one for the request, one for the response, at every click of the application. If it's something very small, like this one, it only contains one name, it's not an issue. But if you start storing more comp complex information into the session, your requests and response headers will become fatter. You will require more bandwidth and more time, processing time. Hmm? Uh, there are more sophisticated ways of handling sessions in which the dictionary itself is stored locally on the server. And to the browser, I only send one uh, ID, one identification string. So locally in the server, I store many session data, each with its own ID. And to the browser, I only send the ID, which is always encrypted and, uh, and protected by encryption, so that when the browser sends make the next request, I get the ID and I say, sort of unlock the dictionary corresponding to this request. So I can, in this case, I can store even large amount of data into the session because the, day, the session data will always stay locally. And if somebody compromises the, the encryption key, well, only cookies get compromised, not the real data, because data never gets sent to the browsers. So more, say, sophisticated application servers do this. And there are also extensions for, for Flask for doing this. So if you ever happen to, that, to store large amount of data into the session, look for the exten flex extensions for storing session into files or into database, into local server storage, instead of going back and forth with the browser. But for the moment, we don't need it. So uh, that was the, let's say, the complete solution to the exercise. You saw that if I click on continue, our Concern was I get the old home page. No, actually I get the new home page. No, uh, what do I get? An error? No, I get the new home page. You see that my name has been inserted here, and uh, the form is no longer present, and instead some other text is being uh, inserted. Because at this point I had, I recognized some value, some va variable values into the, the session variable so it could customize the page. And it's very common to have at least one value, which is maybe the username, the login name, or a Boolean saying session valid or not, to be checked on every page. So after login, this becomes valid, or after a successful login, because right now we don't have any password to check. But, and, uh, and so check it in, in every session. Uh, the way to destroy a session is to delete the values from the dictionary. So delete is the Python instruction for removing an element from a collection or from a dictionary, as in this case. So if I remove the key called user, at the next time, this template will find this variable empty, and so will assume that this is like the first request of the website, right? So this is the mechanism. It's a bit strange at the beginning, but it's uh, since you, are, you have many methods that get, call, get called in different ways at different times, you, you don't have control. They are not called sequentially, all these methods. They are called according to the user clicks. Just remember that if you have some information available here 
and you want it to be available in some other method, you must store it into the session. Hmm? And the session is uh, one per each user. Hmm? Because it's stored in the user browser. OK? Your question. Yes, yes. If you have 20 different users navigating the website at the same time, each of them will get a different copy of the session data. The code is the same. But the method will be called, imagine in parallel many times, but when you are calling the method, you are giving me your copy of the cookies. And he's, if he's calling the same method at the same time, he will give me his copy of the cookies. So I will reply, I will do different computations, and I will reply to both of you with an updated copy of the session. So it's uh, uh, the, the, um, the server still doesn't remember about the users. But every user will provide the server the, the amount of information that the server needs to reply correctly to each of them. Just remember, never store anything globally. Because if you store something here, if you do something like uh, user equal uh, something, this variable will be shared by all the users of the website. Because uh, it will be stored into the web application that is shared among different users. So no, never do that. Only maybe constant values or constant information that is valid for everybody, but not variable data. Because otherwise, every user will overwrite the other ones, always inside the session. OK. So right now, we have the, the basics hmm, for handling data. The mm, next step is to make it less, a bit less ugly from the, uh, let's say, uh, vis uh, visual point of view. So right now we concentrated our templates uh, by writing oops, just uh, HTML code. It was very simple, of course, on purpose, with a, a variable in between. Hmm? What we will uh, look today is how to style the text. Actually, uh, web pages are, if, if you just use the HTML elements, uh, they all come in uh, black and white, a single column, uh, fixed fonts, uh, all with the same fonts, and so on. Hmm? And so they're very boring to look at. There is a language specifically for styling web content, for giving style and layout. Uh, style in uh, typography means uh, fonts, uh, colors, font variants, so italic, bold, or whatever, font sizes, and so on. Uh, and layout means basically spacing. Uh, the spaces, the borders, uh, uh, the columns, uh, and so on. Hmm? Um, we want to make styling or visual information in general separate from the HTML pages. We want to be able to change the text color of our website by modifying one line instead of going modifying uh, every line of code, every template in our project. OK? If you ever happen to write uh, maybe a, a Word document of more than 10 pages and then you decided to change the font of the, of the titles, of the paragraph titles, you know what I mean. If you, do, if you use styles, it's OK. You just change it in one place. If you don't use styles, you have to go ha by hand and modify each of them. Hmm? And uh, uh, we want to do this uh, by also using, uh, hey, let's say, having a good uh, styling library and framework also for supporting mobile devices. So in many cases, you want to write a website uh, that is visible both from our desktop and from the mobile. 
And this can be done, it's called, uh, they call it responsive uh, design, by exploiting correctly the styles. But back to the technical part. How do we separate style information from content? Well, the content is in, in the HTML. That's fine. Uh, the W3C started very long time ago. It's more than uh, 12 years. Uh, that they started to work on this CSS, cascading style sheets. It's, the idea is that uh, you can specify the style of your web pages into an external file. This is called the CSS file. And everything is encoded uh, uh, with this uh, idea. You have one HTML page, and you have a set of, ru of rules that apply to the elements in the page. By element, I mean the HTML elements. Every rule has a matching part, a selector, that selects, highlights some elements. And an action part that uh, modifies some attributes of those elements that were selected. So this means, these rules means uh, select all the H1 elements in the HTML page, and for each of them, modify the property color to the value blue, and modify the property font size to the value 12 pixels. And this gets applied with one rule to all the H1 elements. So I have uh, CSS is basically a long set of rules that are applied in the same way. Selector selects some elements in the page. The action or the rules uh, apply, modify some parameters. These parameters, these properties, are, of course, defined in a standard uh, way. And every HTML element has a specific set of properties, depending on, on what kind of element it is. Style sheets. A style sheet is a set of rules. Why do we call it cascading style sheet? Cascading means that you can have different layers of rules, of, of styles, that apply on top of each other. You can define uh, styles uh, into the browser. The browser itself knows how to render an H1 heading with a given font, with a given size, because the browser manufacturer decides some styles. And then the uh, users can modify that, but actually no users do that. Then you're the author of the, the page. The author styles are the styles that are associated with each HTML page. Okay? So the styles that we write as web creators. And we there are, these other styles are of, of two types, external or inline. External means the styles uh, stored in a separate file from the HTML file. So it's a CSS file externally. Otherwise, you can also have inline styles, so styles apply to a specific element uh, with the style attribute attached to the element. So I can write, for example, P, style equal to something. And so the selector in this case is implicit because it's that element they want to apply to style. I discourage everything except external uh, style sheets. Okay, we don't want to mess with the individual elements. We want to have it standard outside. And so our style takes the precedence, actually redefine the default styles imposed by the browser. And uh, I might also have different rules that apply or match the same elements. So one element may be matched by different rules. And some rules will modify some of its properties. Some other rules will modify other properties. And all of this sums up. All the properties are modified with the application of every, day, every set of rules. We show how, how it can be that the same element is matched multiple times, because there are different types of selectors that are not mutually exclusive. 
And there's also a priority that says that if I have a more specific, specific selector, it takes the precedence over a more general selector. So I could say, for example, all the test is red, and then say the, um, the headings text is green. And so the heading text is also, also matched by the all the text rule, but it's more specific, so it takes the precedence. This present system just makes sense. It's a, so how does it look like? We have a normal HTML document. And inside the HTML document, we have one statement in the head of the document itself, not in the body. It's a link statement that says, this doc, to this document, you must link this file style.css with the role of style sheet. Rel means relationship type. So link for what? For acting as a style sheet. And the, the type, the syntax is text slash CSS. So whenever we want to apply one style to one page, we link a style sheet in this way. At that point, the browser will apply all the rules in that file to any element in the HTML code. And in this case, we have two rules, h1 and h2. The first rule selects all the h1 elements, is this one, and applies font size, font family, and color to this. And h2 is a heading of second level, has a different style applied. <laughs> But if I have many H1s down there, they, all will, they will all look the same, because the same rule will be applied to all of them. If I want to change the color of the H1, I just need to change it here. And if all the web pages, all the templates, we are, if you are speaking Flask, all the templates in the page refer to the same style sheet, then every element in every page of our site will always be customizable by modifying just one single file, one point or one, or one file. Uh, there are other ways of doing that, but uh, we don't care. Hmm? And then, of course, there are a lot of details. The basic principle is very simple. Things get complicated because we need to learn, on one side, the rules of selectors. And on the other side, the properties of the different HTML elements. What do they do? Hmm? Uh, by the way, one, uh, there is one way of making some uh, rules more important than others, but they're, always used, they're usually used to correct some bugs in the browsers. Uh, the way these rules are applied Think of the HTML text as, as a tree of elements. Hmm? HTML is structured as a tree of elements that nest into each other. So if I have a rule that applies to the body element, it will be inherited by all the elements inside, um, inside the body, all the children and grandchildren of the body. So for example, with these two rules, I'm saying that everything in the body is a, is a text color green, but H1 is red. So I'm applying green to body, and it will transitively apply to P, this P, this H1, this number list, and this list items. So everything will be green. But immediately after, conceptually, these rules is applied, and they will, be, they will modify H1 properties overwriting with red the previous green, and everything which is nested inside H1, which currently is nothing. Hmm? So we have this sort of uh, cascading by applying one style sheet on top of the other, and more and more selectively, with, uh, with a smaller and smaller number of elements as we go. The selector, selectors are very rich. There's a very rich syntax on selectors. But the three main ingredients 
the most important ones that we should stamp here are element, class, and ID. So element is like we did here. The name of an HTML element, body, p, div, uh, h1, image, and so on. These are predefined. All the images, all the paragraphs, and so on. So the selector is just the name of the element that will match every HTML element with the tag. That's it. But it's also not very powerful because it applies equally or across all the page. So we could mark specific elements, specific paragraphs, specific titles, specific images with a flavor. So these paragraphs are part of the introduction. These paragraphs are part of the body of the article, for example. These paragraphs contain the signature of the author, and they should be styled differently. But they are all paragraphs. So what I can do is to assign a class to any HTML element by using the class attribute with any string name. Class equal text, class equal introduction, class equal my text, whatever. It's just a string, just a name. Okay? And you can apply the same class to many elements, even if the elements are of different types. So it's a class can be applied to a P and to an image. It's up to you. You are just attaching a label to an element. And in the CSS, you can select the class with the dot syntax. Point, class name, selects all the elements with that class name. So you can select by element type or by class name. So it happens that an element of that type with that name will match both selectors. There's also a third main way of selecting elements by ID. ID means a unique identifier. It's a predefined attribute in HTML. And in an HTML page, a given ID can only be um, assigned to one element. So the title, that one, the signature, the address, the menu, okay, the comment box, or whatever. So if I want to identify one specific element in the HTML, I can assign one ID attribute to that element, whatever it is, and I can refer from the CSS file to this ID with the hash selector, hash ID name. So they actually work in the same way. Dot matches class, hash matches ID. The real difference is that ID is unique inside the page. So if I'm matching by ID, I will always get one element or zero, if there is no such ID. If I match it by class, I could match many more elements, if many of them have the same class. Right? So these are the basic, let's say, constructors of the syntax of selectors. And uh, you can combine them in different ways. <coughs> For example, you can say, see at the bottom, div.warning. So div is an element name, dot warning is a class name. So it will match all the div elements with class equal warning. Or e slash uh, e hash uh, id. So they will match the element e of type e only if it has the specific id. It would be quite useless in this case because ids are unique. But the element dot class is very often used. And then there are a lot of many other <coughs> um, ways of, com of creating these selectors. Any element, any element which is inside, nested inside another element, uh, and, uh, and so on. There is a long uh, way of selecting elements. So all of this goes into the selector type. 
for selecting groups of elements. But the main ones are, of course, the element uh, and uh, what is the class and the hash. The class is here and the ID is here. The others are basically for getting the first element, the left one, the selected one, the one with the mouse uh, over it, and so on. Hmm? Or for more advanced uh, um, selections. OK, let's skip this. And uh, so <clears throat> what is the idea? Is that uh, we should try to create our HTML with mm, elements as meaningful as possible by using the correct text, and then apply IDs and class names to all these elements. When I write the HTML, I should apply IDs and classes semantically, according to the meaning, to the content of the page. Later, I will develop um, a, a style sheet file that will give a visual style to these elements so that it can, can be changed even later. So take the, the habit of marking with classes or, or segmenting your, uh, say, your page with different elements. Uh, there is one, um, one problem, let's say. If I'm writing, for example, an article, okay? The article is made of many paragraphs. And then there will be also other paragraphs in the page. So how do I mark the set of paragraphs that constitute the body of the article, the main content of the article? I could say that for each of the paragraphs, these are of class article. But I need to repeat it for every paragraph. It would be better or easier to mark with a class article the container of these paragraphs. But if the paragraphs are, this, are directly inside the body, there is no nest element, HTML element that is nested outside these paragraphs. What we need here is some elements that are only useful for nesting for delimiting groups of other elements. Say, OK, let's group the, all of this. I, I have an HTML element that is called div, stands for division, that divides the page into two different blocks. This div element does nothing. By itself, it doesn't change the page of one pixel. Nothing. But it's an element that they can, they can use to group different paragraphs, for, for example. And so it can give a class to this div element, and the style sheet can style all the content of this element, even if it's composed of many other elements or paragraphs. Or and we have two such elements that are just thought in the HTML for marking up, for dividing, for grouping. The div that works at the paragraph level, and the span that works into the line level. If, if inside the line, I want to mark a word, make it standing out, I can use span elements, span slash span, that mark some running text inside the line. In HTML, they call it, the div is a block level element, so the paragraph level element, and the span is an inline element, so inside paragraph, inside text. Like you do when you are setting something in bold, inside the line, b slash b. Span is a generalized form that by itself does nothing, but you can give a class to it, and, you can, and then you can give a style to that class. Hmm? Um, for example, let's take our application. We want in the title to make, uh, I don't know, this paragraph with a welcome stand out in some way. Let's say we want to make it red. So I don't want to write red here. I just say that this is a class welcome. So I, I attach the label welcome to this paragraph, P. 
And then what do I need to do? I need to create a style sheet. A style sheet it must be created into the static files to be linked. Into static, we call it styles, for example. And we say that everything with class welcome, the selector dot welcome, everything with class welcome must be in red. I could also write p.welcome. That would only call and read the paragraph p with class welcome. Not everything with class welcome. Depends. Hmm? But in this case, we only have one line. I'm not done because right now, this uh, style sheet, which is complete, <laughs> uh, is not, isn't called. We need to link the style sheet from the HTML page. So where is it? In the head. We have to link. Uh, so a href to the file slash static slash styles dot CSS with the relationship of style sheet. Thank you for not helping. And with that type, let me check. Uh, not this one. Yes, type. Uh, yeah. Type is text plus CSS. So, if everything is working, we should be able to reload our application and see that this text is still ugly, but now it's red. It's an ugly red. And if you want to maybe highlight in some way the login form, well, this login form is composed of many different elements. Oh, sorry. Of many different elements. So in the HTML, we see it here. So what I could do is to include it into a div. Login area. That will also be a logout area. So all of this area is here. So I don't need a paragraph anymore. So I marked this area, login area, with this. Uh, then I have a P here, class footer. What's better, I have a div. So I just changed and I grouped some elements with the div. Nothing is visible yet. Because I just give names to blocks of text. If you see the source, you see it's the new one with these divs. But until we modify the CSS to, mod to change them, nothing happens. We can go to the styles and say that uh, for example, in the div with name uh, uh, form, no, login area, we want to apply a set of styles, for example. For example, uh, I don't know, background, color, yellow, and, and the text. Uh, 
blue. And maybe in the footer, we want to have the text size, uh, no, the font size smaller, maybe 70%. And if we reload the page, cross fingers, yeah. It's even uglier, OK? Yeah. But we modified the text color here. We modified the background color there of this division. And we made a footer written with a smaller text. So of course, there's a lot of hidden knowledge here, because we would need to know all these properties. Again, I think this table contains a link to pages and pages of properties that can be applied to different elements. Hmm? So we to, to to make some kind of effect, you need to find, for example, the font is a group of uh, properties, style, variant, weight, size, height, family, and so on. Everything for changing the aspect of individual characters. Font uh, is something like, you know, in, in Word, you would call it the character, format character. Instead, the text attributes uh, uh, text, 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 uh, do with the formatting of the paragraphs. Spacing, single spacing, double spacing, alignment, left margin, right margin, and so on. And uh, these are the, the two basic ones. Then you have everything about margins, about borders, about uh, uh, spacing, and so on. Now, there are, you, can, you can stay for days in, uh, in reading these elements. So you have the list of the attributes here and the list of uh, elements that, to which they apply. If you click on any of these, you get to the definition with all the details. But the mechanism is the same. It's mainly a matter of learning and knowing what are the different properties that can be applied to the elements. And uh, with this knowledge, you can do so right now, we did only, uh, say, basic formatting, what I call the styling. The next step would be also of doing layout, so positioning element and defining spacing. So for layouts, uh, uh, the CSS uh, model applies uh, this set of nested boxes. It's called uh, the box model. So for understanding. Uh, the spacing and the positioning element, we should, we should always refer to this one. So imagine you have a content. Maybe one letter, maybe one image, one paragraph, the cell of a table, one full table itself. It applies recursively. Every time the layout engine of HTML puts a content on the page, it always adds three levels of margins around it. That can be zero, of course. But there's a padding. A padding of an element is some space extending from the content itself with the same background of the content. It's a sort of private internal area, which is a bit larger. Imagine you have a letter or a table. You don't want any other table to be attached to it. You need some space between the two. So every element can have the, what we call the padding. So an internal border, let's say. Then we have the, what is called the border, which is a visible border around the element or some, some of the size of the element. 
And then outside the border, we have the margin, which is a distance from other elements. They are in three different colors because the padding is on the, has the same background color of the content. The border has its own color. You can define the color of the border independently. And the margin has the background color of the containing element of the page, maybe, or of the column in which the content lies. So by combining these three measures, you can, have, you can obtain many type of, of effects. Hmm? Uh, and you can control each of them with the margin padding white uh, attributes. So you can have borders of different spacing and uh, Maybe there are some examples here. If I make the padding smaller, you see that the text is closer to its border. So the padding is an inside margin from the border of the element to the actual content, some air <laughs> to give to the element. This big and ugly blue box is the border. So it may be solid, may be dotted, may be smaller with only two pixels. It's a border. And then we have a margin which is the distance from of this element, of this board, or element contained by its padding and its border, from surrounding elements. And surrounding elements may be the margins or other elements that are put uh, besides it. So you may have another div, for example, with the same text, and here they have distance. This distance is the margin. If I decrease the margin, they will get clo uh, decrease. They will get closer. In this case, they also get uh, farther to the left because I just defined one margin. But I can define the margin bottom differently for the margin left. So I can shift them horizontally in a different quantity and so on. So there's a lot of play, uh, uh, to play you know, with these uh, values depending on what you want to achieve. Don't get crazy on these uh, attributes because we will learn uh, one library. It's called Bootstrap that simplifies a lot of this stuff that already comes with a lot of predefined styles and margins and colors and backgrounds that are also nicer to see that, than what we can do by hand. Okay. Um, la last point, again, I don't want to get too much into details because we will use Bootstrap for them, but just to understand what we can, we can do, is the, the flowing and floating of elements. So right now, what we did was still constrained to a normal flow. What does it mean, normal flow? Left to right and top to bottom. But in web pages, we may also want two column layout, or three columns, or some. You know, the order of the text may be different. We, we, we want to put a, a picture on the side of the text instead of above or below. Hmm? And this can be done with additional attributes, uh, controlling the layout. Um, mainly, we have a way of positioning the boxes. And a box is what you've just seen, content, padding, margin, and, uh, border, and margin. And they can be positioned one to the other in different ways. Usually, they are positioned one below the other. They are block level elements. But you can move them with three different 
algorithms. One algorithm is uh, I lay out the box normally, and then I move it. And they keep everything else in the page fixed. So this is used for animation, for drop downs, uh, for something like that. When I move this, of course, it, I have the risk of covering other information. And the other possibility is uh, of laying out the page, pulling out the object. So you see that box number two is no longer here. You have, in the first case, it's called the relative position. It's being shifted re relatively to its uh, default position, but the space taken by the default position is still taken. Okay. In this case, we just lay out box one and three. Sorry, we pull out box number two from the layout algorithm, and then we position it according not to its previous position because it didn't have any previous position, but according to the corner of the containing element. And the other way is uh, doing this kind of uh, absolute positioning, but uh, relative not to the containing element, which can be an HTML div, for example, but relative to the window. So you see some maybe website in which you can scroll down, down, but some elements are still in the same position in the web page. That would be a fixed position. They are, tri they are tricky. They are complex to get right. But we have all the basic algorithmic um, primitives to create any kind of layouts. <laughs> so we can create uh, some fixed compositions, the classical four area, in which some dimensions can be also specified in, in percentage so that they, they can scale when the browser window increases or shrinks. We may have uh, boxes that float out of the order to, uh, to the right and to the left. Uh, we may have text that goes around fi uh, figures. The control over when we go into the new paragraph. And the classical content, one left column, one right column, uh, a heading and a button, or maybe three columns, navigation and content that is made of main content and uh, advertising, usually, in this way. So all of these layouts uh, are difficult to get right. They use these CSS tricks, but they use a lot of uh, special cases because uh, if you want to get them right across all the browsers and make them easy to resize so that they behave correctly if you shrink or if you enlarge the page, and you need uh, not all the browsers support all of the attributes in the same way, so you can get some strange effect with some browsers or others. Hmm? The idea is that the basic idea is just selectors and properties. The problem is that there are many, many properties, and they interact with each other in strange ways. All the merging, all the floating, all the positioning, they all do the same thing. They mangle the boxes. But how they interact is complex and difficult to manage. All the border in the corner, around the corners, and so on. So we'll not learn and go into much detail over the raw CSS code. But we use Bootstrap that always gives us simplified models and already solves for us all the uh, compatibility issues uh, that we need. So for doing uh, three columns, we don't need to do the floats uh, by hand, but we just use the, 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 the Bootstrap grid. Hmm? So uh, next time, we'll spend some time in uh, having a look at Bootstrap. <laughs>